So this was a case of an abdominal pain of unknown origin. Um, can you change the next slide? Okay, thanks. So he's a 30-year-old male from Ohio, and his chief complaint is the stabbing periumbilical pain um, and IBS-like symptoms that started when he was 16 years old. Go to the next slide. So he had the sudden onset pain in 2003. He remembered that he was walking up a flight of stairs. He had had no previous history of any kind of abdominal surgeries, and he had no trauma to the area, anything like that. Um, he described the pain as a constant knife-like um, at baseline, a 3 out of 10 pain, but he would get these random flares throughout the day of 8 out of 10 pain lasting for 45 minutes to an hour. And during these flares, he would get these IBS-like symptoms and he would get diarrhea, bloating. Um, if he had eaten certain foods that he tried to identify as triggers um, and his abdomen had more bloating and gas and got distended, the pain would hurt more. But this pain and symptoms only happened during these flares of the eight out of 10 pain. Um, next slide, please. So we only got records, since he's from Ohio, we were able to get records from Cleveland Clinic, Columbus, and Mayo Clinic, and since they only keep records for so many years, we only we only got them starting in October 2013. So in October 2013, he went to his PCP and said that he was still having all these symptoms, and he really wanted to find a reason for why he was having this really localized pain. Um, so she sent him to get a HIDA scan to see if he was having gallbladder issues because of all the diarrhea and the pain and the bloating after eating, um, but he got the HIDA scan and his ejection fraction was 80%. And then he also got a right upper quadrant ultrasound, which showed no convincing finding to account for his pain. He had no wall inflammation or pericolecystic fluid and his common bile duct also was normal. So after that, he got some labs drawn. He had a complete metabolic panel, a CBC and a lipase, and they were all within normal limits. Um, so getting no answer there, he asked for a stool gram stain. He got a stool culture and um, a sugar toxin assay, and they were all negative as well. Next slide. Okay. So then after that, he got referred to a GI doctor at Cleveland Clinic, and that person did a colonoscopy with random biopsies up through his terminal ileum. All the paths came back as normal tissue, no pathologic findings. Um, so that was all in the month of October. So now on November 11th, 2013, um, he went back to his PCP and she ordered a helical CT of his abdomen and pelvis on pass. And all it showed was a mildly thickened appendix with no surrounding inflammation. So she then referred him to a general surgeon at Cleveland Clinic, and he underwent a lap api and cholecystectomy, and all the tissue findings from that were also normal. Next slide. So in a surgery follow-up appointment, he was telling the surgeon that his symptoms were still unchanged. His surgeon then said, you know, then this is very likely not a surgical problem. Um, I'm going to sign off on this, um, and I'll send you back to GI just so you have someone to see. So this was in April 2014, went back to GI, and then they did an upper scope with biopsies for <coughs> celiac, and it was all normal, tissue was all normal. Um, after that, the GI ordered a pH breath test for a lactose intolerance, which was also negative. And in the meantime, the patient keeps calling and asking what the next step is. And he keeps just getting thrown around from GI to surgery, back to his PCP. He just keeps ordering more tests and more things and sending him to another GI doctor. Um, and then he was kind of lost to follow up a little bit in 2015. Um, next slide, please. So he went back to his PCP, requesting a pancreatic insufficiency workup, and all of those labs were still within normal limits. So then she sent him to a different GI doctor in Columbus in 2017, who said, well, maybe you have a hernia, ordered a KUB 
and it was normal uh, just for the IBS like findings. Um, and this was at a point where he explained to the GI doctor that he could live with the uh, diarrhea and things like that. Um, he just wanted to find a reason for this pain that he was having. So he said, maybe you are just having some kind of distension, constipation, something like that. So the KUB was normal. Referred him to general surgery again in Columbus instead of Cleveland Clinic. And they did another abdominal CT with instruction to bear down during the imaging to see if he had any incarcerated hernias or anything like that. Um, so the CT only just showed some diverticulosis of the colon. So then he went to see his new general surgeon in January of 2018. This general surgeon said that she would do an X-lap to rule out an occult hernia of a focal fibrolipoma. So, next slide, please. So he went, he had the X-lap in February of that year, um, which really showed a two millimeter hernia with preperitoneal fat, um, but the surgeon injected 1% lidocaine to the area of the distribution of pain he was having, and the pain went away for three to four weeks. So he went to a surgery follow-up in July of that year and said the pain was back. And then the patient mentioned that he thought the lidocaine injection helped and wanted referred to pain management in the Columbus area. The surgeon said she didn't even know a name of anyone that did pain medicine in Columbus and that she would get back to him. So three days later, there's a telephone encounter in his chart that she gave him the name of the clinic. Um, so kind of just to summarize, so far, he was having this pain <clears throat> that kind of was extensively worked up, and he, they found a lot of kind of normal findings that most people would have, like diverticulosis and things like that, a little bit of an inflamed appendix, but he had these two surgeries and an x lap and they kept just kind of bumping it back and forth from different GI doctors and different surgeons. Um, so next slide, please. So now he, after the x lap he was seen at a pain clinic that she referred him to, and the physician at, at this facility recommended trigger point injections with Kenalog. Um, so that was performed like a week later um, and provided him five days of relief. Um, in the meantime, he was referred to a different physician um, in GI now Mayo Clinic, um, which he was previously at GI in both Columbus and Cleveland. So this guy, or this person at Mayo Clinic um, was seeing him for the abdominal pain as well as the bloating, suggested the TPIs like they had tried for the pain, and did a very similar workup to every other GI doctor with, for the bloating, the celiac um, testing, stool giardia, breath test, C. difficile toxin. Again, finding nothing. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so he was then he was then seen by a general surgeon at this Ohio Health um, where he had been to the pain clinic and because he had noticed this abdominal bulge. Um, the, this general surgeon thought maybe this could be a recurrent hernia from that small two millimeter one he had, um, but he couldn't palpate the defect, but there was that significant pain with palpation um, to that area of pain that he's had this whole time. Um, ultimately, this physician said that he wasn't going to do surgery because that was tried before without success. Um, and so what ended up happening and how he got here is that he, um, a, a family friend of his referred him to the WVU Executive Medicine Clinic um, this, this March. So you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, when he was seen here, um, the HPI is basically all that we have just talked about. His physical exam was benign, um, except for just the um, pain to palpation of that area around the umbilicus, and um, no significant social history, no alcohol or drug use, anything like that, um, no family history. Um, so really just this localized pain that's been worked up ad nauseum, basically. Um, and so... Here, Dr. Navelgund, is, um, who was seeing him, tried some trigger point injections in that superficial area since that had helped previously, but he did it with 0.25% um, bupivacaine rather than the Kenalog that provided about 10 days of relief. Um, so at, at that point, he 
this he offered him um, cryo ablation to the area um, since this was only providing temporary relief and we had localized he now thought it was this anterior cutaneous nerve distribution that he could then um, cryo ablate and get him some more long-term results so last Monday um, Kristen and I got to watch this be performed where he went in and cryobladed the area at WVU Hospital. Um, you can go to the next slide. So unfortunately, he has not been back to follow up with us after this. Um, it's next week or so, but not, Dr. Dr. Navelgund has talked to him on the phone, and he says that he's doing well about a week after the procedure. Um, so, so far, it's looking good. Um, next slide, please. And so the neat thing about this cryoablation is that this cryoablation is used for many things, but it's never been used necessarily here for um, superficial cutaneous nerves. And so if this works, that could be something um, like another tool in the wheelhouse for people. Um, but so cryoablation, just a little bit about it quickly. You're intentionally damaging the nerves. You use image guided insertion of probes onto the area of the nerve, and then the probe conducts this, the extremely cold temperatures with liquid nitrogen or argon gas, um, and then you follow it by a period of rapid rewarming, which causes the neurolysis. And while this is going on, um, you put cotton over the skin area and make sure that it's wet just to prevent um, frostbite to the superficial area. Um, so this damage then causes the like um, a disruption in the pain signaling from the area of pain to the brain. Um, so like this guy had, he basically had trial injections done prior to localize what nerve is causing the pain to ensure that this more invasive measure um, will work. Next slide, please. Um, so the relief is a variable time length. It just depends on how quickly that person's nerves regenerate over time but on the order of months is like the typical time frame, And then it can be repeated if desired when the pain comes back. Um, so some of the more common uses for this cryoablation are, um, you can do medial branch nerves for like facet joint arthritic pain with people who have pacemakers. You can do this for occipital neuralgia, ilioinguinal nerves, and the intercostal nerves. Um, so that's just a little bit of background on cryoablation. So our overall thoughts um, for the case and why we thought this was so interesting was one, the new um, adaptation of this cryoablation procedure for the superficial cutaneous origin of the pain um, as you know, one of the many opioid sparing modalities of pain or of treatment for pain that's offered here at the pain clinic. Yeah, so but one thing that I thought was super interesting was that he kept having these symptoms and at one point, he had mentioned prior to having one of his many scopes, they gave him some Ativan, and he said that that relieved the pain for the rest of the day, even after just, I think it was the EGD that he had. Um, so I think after that, they should have uh, maybe referred him to a behavioral medicine clinic to maybe think if it's, there's something maybe a little psychosomatic going on with the pain. Um, because also in his chart, he mentioned that he had low back pain as well. Um, and they also extensively worked that up. He had multiple MRIs. They sent him to a neurosurgeon for a consult. And the neurosurgeon just kind of said, what are you doing here? Um, and things like that. So it was just pretty interesting to me that they kept just kind of passing this guy around for about 14 years. And... Um, really never found a solution for him. So that's kind of like our main point is that maybe a referral to a pain clinic earlier on could have circumvented some of these really invasive measures like an X lab. And we could have tried something less invasive prior to like going to that extreme measure. So that's kind of what we had for you guys today. Any questions? Hey, this is Charlie. I have a, what's his social history and, and what's his medication history? Did you guys look into that at all? So his medication history, he was on no medications. He tried NSAIDs, especially for, um, he would try NSAIDs, but they didn't do anything for it. And then for the IBS-like symptoms, they put him on an anti-spasmodic, um, I can't remember the name, like Reglin or 
I can't remember what it was, but he was never on any opioids or anything. And I think he only had the Ativan the one time prior to the EGD. And he said that that made the pain go away. Other than that, he hadn't, um, try, oh, he tried um, gabapentin and uh, celecoxib, but, but that was prescribed here in March. They, Dr. Navelgun put him on that for prior to the procedure. Other than that, no real medication was tried. And similar to what she said, like there was almost no social history in any of those reports at all. Um, so that's kind of something that got missed along the way, like a more detailed social history. Yeah. And he didn't like, have any kind of um, trauma. He had this, um, I think he was from kind of like a fairly affluent family in the Cleveland area. Um, so I think that's why, also why he kept getting referrals to Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, Ohio State, and why they kept trying to find something. So, um, but other than that, I mean, he didn't, there was nothing in the, any of the notes. They, so I don't even know if they conducted one or anything, but I think a behavioral medicine referral maybe would have helped. Did he use a topical patch question? Came in. Mm, no. Um, no lie to Durham, Greg. Excellent. So from a psychological standpoint, you know, as a psychiatrist, when patients somatize, they're usually suppressing an undesirable emotion. So often that's anger. And so the suppressing, it makes them feel anxious. So maybe the lorazepam re relieved the anxiety he was feeling from suppressing an emotion that comes out as pain if it was a somatization kind of picture. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's possible, if there was, I guess there wasn't a lot of uh, secondary gain from prescribed abusable medications, but you know, for that long a period, you'd wonder if he didn't get some opiates or benzos or you know, something along those lines and maybe some malingering. But the fact that he's responding to the cryoablation suggests something physical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, he'd be a really good malingerer if he laid down twice for an exploratory laparotomy. So he'd get the prize in my book. <laughs> Is the prize opioids? Or <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have a question about the cryoblation. How long is it good for and will he require repeat treatments? And, yeah. and what happens with when this sort of, does this wear off or I know you're damaging the nerve in your every generation. So I suspect if it's a continuous nerve issue, it's going to come back. Lesion size dependent. So it's lesion size dependent. Variable length. A variable length. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear the, I hear the, uh, I hear the, uh, yeah. it depends. So it just depends on how quickly that nerve regenerates. So it varies person to person, but I t think it's typically like months, like six months range or so, and you can repeat it if they get success with it. Generally six months, Charlie. Okay, thank you. And the procedure was pretty, it was pretty quick. They just put an IV and I think they gave him some Versed um, and he just mm. kind of went to sleep. Um, and it was, I think it was about a 10 minute long procedure. They freeze it for three minutes, rapid rewarm, and then refreeze, and then rapid rewarm, and then they roll you out of the OR. So it was pretty quick. It's actually the rewarming that's the treatment because that causes lysis of the cell. But the myelin sheath is preserved, so that's what allows it growing back. So it's not a total disruption, so you don't have to worry about deafferentation. Okay. Mm, cool. No pun intended. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Icy hot in a taser. <laughs> <laughs> Well, awesome. Thank you both. That was wonderful. Does anybody else have any questions, comments, impressions? Excellent. Thank you, guys. Uh, so, Dr. Garofoli, if you're cool, I'll go ahead and share yours. Great. Boom. Um. So we're going to go over uh, just kind of a conglomerate of random new pain medications uh, that have come to the market or, or are working their way as well, too. Um, do you just jump to the next slide? It's, this is also, I believe, the unveiling of the Echo PowerPoint template background thing, too. So 
Um, I already went over learning objectives. We're gonna go to over new medications. So the next, here's a general gist of um, some of the newer products that are out there. Um, one of them actually is not on market yet, but to, to be determined, I guess we'll say. Uh, it's certainly not an all encompassing list. There's maybe one or two other ones that I could throw in at the end if you guys wanted, but this is the gist of what we'll just cover briefly. Uh, next slide. First thing's, first thing's gonna be the calcitonin gene related peptide or CGRPs. Uh, we love our acronyms, of course. Uh, so this is the revolution of the migraine market. Um, migraines to me, uh, thank God I don't have them. Uh, but it, it's one of those as far as diagnosis goes, uh, the way that we work things up, it's, to me it's very troubling because we have these requirements of saying that you have to have for a real chronic migraine scenario and treatment, you have to have like basically one every other day or if not more. And, I, you know, one a week is really disruptive to anyone's life. Um, at least it would be to mine. So these things, these particular products as a new avenue, a new mechanism of action uh, are really making pretty big impact for people. Uh, lots of studies out there, but just talking about the observations. So basically the CGRP stuff is throughout the body, but we're really concentrating on uh, the CNS and the brain area, specifically the trigeminal nerve overall. And that's really where we're going to see the action for these things as far as migraines go or migraine treatment. Um, next slide. So here's a chart I threw together of what's out there and available right now. Uh, in addition, the fourth product is coming to market uh, relatively soon, um, either any day now or the end of the year or next year, however the market works it, of course. Uh, but uh, the application was accepted already. So. Just going uh, in the comparison here, um, I, I apologize for including brand names, but when we're talking MABs, I feel like we just need to be real and say a brand name every now and then. So if you're recording this, I know, I, I, I'm sorry. Um, so we're going to use the brand names. <laughs> uh, the first one to the market was the Amovig, and then we now have a Jovi and Ngalti, and the generics are there for you. Uh, what's the difference between them? That's probably one of the biggest parts. Uh, overall, you're seeing uh, when successful, pretty drastic decreases in the amount of migraines and people's lives are getting a lot better um, with a reduction or lack of need for the other typical treatments, which I'm sure we've all had three to six to 60 hours of CE on uh, for the amazing management of migraines overall. But the first one that came to the market, if you go to the middle uh, uh, row for the mechanism of action, that was the actual receptor blocker, and pretty much everything that's come to market after that is now something that actually attaches to the CGRP itself. Uh, tomato, tomato, slight difference there, but it is a completely different mechanism of action, still CGRP related. The big thing there is the first one, the actual receptor blocker. A lot of the GI folks are in an uproar because it's causing, I believe, constipation, and that's one of those limiting steps there. Um, and that's the preference then is to go to the other agents that are attaching directly to the actual CGRP. Um, that's observational. I, I just personally, maybe I don't have the time, but <laughs> just personally haven't seen all these studies and everything indicating that, but that uh, especially actually in the Morgantown or WBU-ish area, uh, that's what we're hearing a lot of. Uh, price for these things is pretty comparable. It's expensive. Uh, but then again, if you add up all the everything else, uh, even medication-wise for other migraine treatments, you're, you're going to come across as relatively a, across the board, really. Uh, typically, as far as the what a, what a person has to do to utilize this medicine, as far as dosage and administration, pretty straightforward. You're going to see a lot of auto-injectors there, uh, most of them or even a pre-filled syringe. So it's, it's relatively patient-friendly, but it is ultimately an injection, so it's not throw a pill in your mouth. Um, and some people aren't too to um, fine with that, but it's straightforward as long as you're okay with that. Uh, dosing is also uh, pretty easy, and currently everything's once a month, if not even every three months. Um, and that, that fourth one that'll be coming around is gonna be an infusion every uh, four months, three months, sorry. That's pretty much about it for that. That, that just wanted to give you the glimpse of what's out there uh, as far as names and the differences there, that, that side effect with the first one is really the big thing. 
Anybody have any questions or thoughts or anything with these or? Hey, Mark, this has been the rate of success with insurance coverage. <laughs> I was expecting others to ask that one, Charlie. <laughs> That's that, like, you're asking a question, you're waiting for that part. Um, the, obviously, the cop-out is it's going to be dependent upon many, many, many different plans. Um, the plans, uh, you know, you take, for instance, things across the state and whatnot. It's a new mechanism. It's a new class of medicines. So whether it's opened up, like if you look at our state's Medicaid and whatnot, whether it's opened up, I, I don't have the specifics on that. Even if it's not, though, as far as prior authorizations, that bad, bad, bad word we all love to hate, um, odds are the, the leaps and bounds that somebody's going to have to go through to get this medicine. If you've had migraines for a while, you're probably going to have already gone through them. So the prescriber, dispenser, whoever is going to fill out that paperwork relatively easily, because just in the lifestyle of having these and the treatments in the past, you probably have been through it already anyway. Um, it's kind of like those uh, Pamoras, the peripheral opioids for constipation. If a patient walks up to a counter in a pharmacy or a clinic and says, I have constipation, they've probably had it for 10 years and have been self-treating and now finally asked you about it because it's constipation. That's not fun. Um, same thing with migraines where they've probably already gone through that. So yeah, there'll be paperwork universally or electronic. Um, but just anecdotally seeing decent access, I can't say that nationally though. So. Good question though. I was hoping for that one. <laughs> Alrighty, um, I guess we could jump to the next ones. Or next slide. So next up is this uh, Ben's hydrocodone. I don't know if you've ever heard of hydrocodone, but we'll talk about that. Uh, brand name is Apodaz. We'll stick to generics for this one, but next slide. This one's pretty funky. Um, I'm the last person to teach MedChem, but every now and then it gets relatively cool in a nerdy way. Uh, so this is simply a pro drug. You're probably already thinking of use deterrent formulation, which in concept perhaps, but not in FDA approval, uh, but certainly the idea here. So you've got hydrocodone with acetaminophen and you add benzoic acid, as you see on the left here, very simple, uh, typically a food preservative and among other things. Um, that's added to your hydrocodone. The GI tract cleaves that off. Uh, they call it ligand activated technology. It goes in your gut and your enzymes cleave the benzoic acid off and then you're left with hydrocodone. Um, this same technology, or uh, concept, not technology, but this same technology thing is being uh, researched with methylphenidate as well. Um, so we'll, we'll, we might see this in, in other facets of life as well too. So pretty general thing. Uh, next slide is one um, thing you wanna keep in mind. You can jump right down to the bottom, the bottom lines here. Very uniquely, the, the thing that stands out is that le if you're looking at the dose there, less of this is equal to more of the regular product, which at least if you're feeble-minded like myself, that's quite baffling because you would think if you're adding benzoic acid to it, you would the numbers would be exactly opposite. Comes down to some technical slash relatively straightforward pharmacology of it getting in the body and absorption, all that great stuff. But the bottom line of what somebody has to remember is that the lesser amount, the 6.12, but the 6 is equal to 7.5 uh, for the hydrocodone part. I, acetaminophen has no relevance for that part. Uh, this is not approved by the FDA as an abuse deterrent formulation, although the intent is obviously as a prodrug abuse deterrent formulation. Um, one of the future talks we are either doing or we're doing here at the clinic, I can't remember, uh, is actually gonna be on abuse deterrent formulation opioids. Uh, and it's really tricky in the current environment to get things approved all the way and to market. Uh, we'll touch on that, I believe, in the next product. But um, things to keep in mind that we, we tend to, as healthcare professionals, jump over when it comes to things like muscle relaxants uh, or even opioids 10, 20 years ago. Uh, this is approved for short term, two weeks max for acute pain. Well, what the heck do we do with our patients that have been on hydrocodone and acetaminophen for 30 years? And there's a thing called off label. There's the reality of it all too, uh, but that is included in the approval. So just wanted to have that in there. Just like hydrocodone acetaminophen, it's a C2. Nothing really changed in there. If you got to take one thing from it, it's just that thing at the bottom there for the, the numbers, the six to seven. 
I, uh, that might be it for that one. So any other questions on that one? Anybody seeing that or prescribing that or, or hearing of its use? No. I'm not is my answer. <laughs> Okay, crickets. The, um, the question in here was, uh, why did they develop that? Um, the big market out there in industry right now is these abuse deterrent formulations. Um, they just, that company never went the next degree to do these specific studies for it. Um, knowing that if you get it to market, if it's not approved as an ADF, it's just that it gets more complicated. But if you have it on a market, you can still have it utilized. So, good question. All right, speaking of ADFs and things coming to market and all that, let's review a drug that you cannot get today. Um, it's basically the immediate release oxycodone that is FDA approved as an ADF, um, and that would be Roxybond. Next slide. So, big picture here as far as abuse, trans opioid abuse transition. Um, I often see this as a circle. It's kind of mind boggling because once somebody's at heroin, you're probably not going to go back to the other stuff. So I make my own. It's linear, uh, not kinetics, but just transition. The, if you're looking in the middle here, it's the age old story. You guys all know it. I hurt my back cutting the grass. I live in West Virginia. I'm on a hill. My neighbor hands me some hydrocodone acetaminophen because he had it left over for his back surgery. Nobody ever went over storage and disposal with them. Turns out it works. I go to Dr. Google. I realize, man, this stuff's good, but uh, the oxycodone acetaminophen is better. I get my hands on that, legal or illegal. And then I go to Dr. Google again, and I end up saying, I don't know, I ain't doing anything. Let's just stick to the oxycodone. Problem is that used to be a buck a milligram on the street. Now it's a buck and a half. I'm spending 600 bucks a day, and there goes my paycheck. So I get over the needle phobia uh, after going nasal route and end up with the buy five, get one free bags of heroin. These days you get a free bag of meth as well business is amazing and that's how I would say this transition the point of abuse deterrent formulations is where that yellow arrow is um, you could take 20 of these things and you're still gonna have a major issue it's preventing that transition to diacetylmorphine heroin so uh, the little orbs here are all just different forms of abuse deterrent formulations some of them just make your nose irritated some of them are the pro drug style we just went over you could combine things you could add naloxone naltrexone you could do um, chemistry that we all did freshman year, but now it's a billion dollar business. You got a lot of options here basically. So next slide. The, the tricky part here is I would call the mirror thing is if you spell FDA backwards, you get ADF and that's what the media would probably cover. But next slide. So this is my, my attempt at explaining how a product gets on our market with FDA approval as an ADF. So you get regular at the top, regular drug approval. That's a lot of drugs. Um, then you get FDA ADF approval, which is a little bit less number of medications. And if you have that approval, your studies are gonna look at typically three different types of abuse, nasal, IV, and oral. If a product is FDA approved as a medicine and FDA approved as an ADF medicine, it doesn't universally mean that it's abuse deterrent in every manner of abuse is my point. It may have been studied only for preventing IV abuse and not for nasal abuse, but it is approved as an ADF. Very convoluted. Um, so you could do all three studies, the INIV and PL, or you could do just, do just one of them uh, a lot of them these days are really just looking at the nasal and the IV, which is relatively appropriate. Um, the PO part's a little, little tricky, the chewing it, if you will. All of that aside, you can also be FDA approved as a drug, as an ADF, and you can have all those studies for the different manners of abuse, and you can just not get to market yet. And that's where this particular product, the oxycodone IR, will be the first IR ADF. Uh, it's approved yet, it, and it's been approved for going on two years now, but it's not on the market. And last I was told, it's because they were looking at manufacturing issues in Puerto Rico, and it was a huge, dare I say, climate change event or whatever, hurricane that affected a lot of things on there, electricity and all that. So it's just not on the market yet. Um, next slide. So if you thought that first one was complicated, 
This is merely for reference and thought. I'm not out of my mind for making a complicated table. Um, this is just if you're looking at the rows, generally speaking, the products that are attempted to be of use deterrent based on the particular opioid included. So if you're looking at oxycodone at the top, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, what I've done here is attempted to include everything from the existence of mankind for opioids with ADF intentions. And then what's highlighted in purple is what uh, has completed the triangle upside down on the previous slide. It's FDA approved in general, FDA approved as ADF, and it's on the market right now. So those are your half a dozen ADF products that are on the market right now. The Charlie's question on the last one, coverage is very sporadic. Uh, there's only about, I think, four or five states that have mandated coverage of ADF products, opioids, uh, in their formularies. We're one of them, actually. But that means that at least one has to be. It doesn't mean that they all have to be. Uh, so to my knowledge, for our state uh, Medicaid formulary, uh, I believe Embedda, at least as of a year ago, was the one for morphine that was covered. Um, but and that leaves Aramo and Morphabond out there um, non-preferred. Um, but in very few states have that mandate um, in general. So you have those six. What's not included on here uh, is the one that I was originally pointing out, the first immediate release ADF that'll be, that's already approved all the way, just not on the market yet. And that's a really, really tricky one in concept of how it's working. Because along the way, all these things have always been an extended release. And the intention is to take something that's a massive dose relatively and prevent that from getting a dose all at one point, which is pretty straightforward in all of our logic as healthcare professionals. The IR formulation cannot do that because when the patient takes the, say, 10 milligrams or whatever, we'll say oxycodone, they still need to get the 10 milligrams of oxycodone. So where the heck does the ADF come into play? Because if you just take the pill, you're still getting the same dose. You're not preventing the 80 milligrams like in the ER. Um, it comes into play for the abuse of it, the misuse of it, the crushing it, the blendering it, the oxycrisping it, or whatever you want to call it, um, so that you're not just getting the pure powder. But if you take the tablet itself, you still get it effective in acute pain. All that makes sense? More questions? I forget if I have another one, but next slide. I do. So we took that last uh, chart and put it down to what's approved all the way and on the market right now for each type of opioid, the three of them, oxycodone, morphine, hydrocodone, and that's what you have in front of you. Um, gosh, random names along the way. Um, that bottom one, hydrocodone, it's named, anybody know why it's called high singla? The HY is for hydrocodone, the SING is for single dose, and the LA is for long acting. It's like one of 10 medicines that makes sense in this world. Um, nothing else is all that remarkable or talkable. So that new, it's like a sublingual fentanyl. Desuvia. Desuvia. Me and my brain names, I tell you. <laughs> so you want to know about that? Yeah. yeah all right. Exactly. So we had questions on, on the newer uh, version of sublingual fentanyl. Um, if you click next slide, just so I know I've got there. All right, I'm gonna come. I'm gonna come back to that at the end because that was actually the one that I omitted because it's used primarily in ERs and whatnot. So all of those things are, are great and whatnot as far as abuse deterrent formulations. One of many methods uh, for reducing risk for patients and providers alike. What's but you can still take 20 pills and call it a day. My version. Um, something that's in the works and has been for a good number of years, but is still struggling to come along is a something that if combined with what's out there already might actually make a big dent. Uh, and that would be this multi-pill abuse resistance. The idea here would be if you take one, maybe two of the pills of whatever, it would work as intended. But as soon as you take multiple pills, like say somebody took six hydrocodone, acetaminophen or whatever, they would magically like crazy amazing chemistry, do something within the body, it's all under patent, so you can't find it online. But I'm thinking that they're just gonna gel together or something in the stomach and you would not, you would actually get nothing. So that would actually address the taking multiple pills. Um, 
it is not on the market yet, it is not out there, we cannot deploy this yet as a, as a method, but it is in the works, has been for a while, but it is in the works. And, and that'll, uh, not even talking anything big farmer or whatever, that'll actually be a good day when we have that weaponry in our tool belt. Um, so, next slide. Boom, thought we were done with that. I'm gonna come to Desuvia after that. Any questions on, on that? We could always do an ADF session someday if you want, but. All right, so uh, final product for this one before the, the Fentanyl one is ZT Lido. Uh, Dr. Peters, you had a, a comment in the, the case we went over for lidocaine. This is, this is coming right at you for the new products, if you will. Next slide. Uh, so we have lidocaine patches. Uh, Topical and debated or conversational for transdermal as far as where the effects actually go. This is the new version of that. Uh, Charlie, your question earlier on coverage, I expect uh, very little uh, initially for this at least, because again, it's, it's hot off the press, on the market and whatnot, but we still should probably know at least about it. Um, been out for a little while now. As far as naming goes, the Z stands for zero water, which in my opinion does nothing for my patients or thoughts. It just means that this product compared to lidocaine has a different um, chemical structure as far as the, the patch goes. The T is for topical um, and then Lido. Sometimes they just gotta come up with a name and ZT Lido, I, I, don't, I don't get it. Um, anyways, it's topical lidocaine new formulation. What the heck makes it different and better and, and why would we even consider it? Um, before we get to that, one thing just to keep in mind is, especially since it's still summer and hot as ever out there, um, I remember working at a pharmacy for a summer that was near the beach and one of the main things we always had to keep in mind was for anything topical, um, that sunburn happens, especially if you're at the beach. So um, it's not here, but if you put a transdermal fentanyl patch on something that is inflamed or the vasodilation, you're going to absorb more and that's not going to go too well. Uh, so same thing to keep in mind here. Um, back to this particular product, uh, this thing, you, if you could see on the picture here, you, it's easier to pull apart as opposed to if you think about taking like a, a sticky postage stamp or something, you got to go by the edges and it's just tough if you don't have nails especially. This thing has the, you, you fold it down the middle, it works a little bit better. Um, same type of dosing, you use up to three for 12. Um, you still don't want to get it wet, um, but people are saying, oh, it sticks a little bit better and whatnot. You, and you can cut the patch uh, to use smaller uh, doses, I guess you'd say, or for areas. Uh, next slide, still on this one. So direct comparison of what's out there, uh, because studies never do that. Uh, formulation, is, it's, goes to that Z within the title. It's just a different polymer, a, a different substance that's holding the medicine in there. Um, the the probably the biggest thing is this this 1.8 percent uh, you're looking at basically equivalent to the five percent for actual effect because of the different chemistry and the makeup of the product. So even though it's a smaller number, you're still looking at typically same effect. Uh, the bottom line probably for the patient is literally at the bottom line of this. Uh, the main goal I believe was to work on the stickiness uh, so that you don't have to duct tape the things to your skin or whatever else you would come up with as patients. <laughs> we hear it all. Um, so that this aims to address that in general. I believe that's it for this one. Next slide. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> um, any questions on their products thus far or? All right, so just because Buzz Lightyear's on the screen, we'll leave this slide on for a little while and touch on the, the uh, sublingual uh, fent sufentanil. Uh, that was brought up that um, anybody want to volunteer anything they've heard or read or or thoughts of your own or or you're wondering what drug I'm talking about or <laughs> so a couple months ago uh, since I'm here nothing a couple months ago another the FDA approved another opioid the heck were they thinking right um, that's what the media says and sometimes we really need to step back and kind of analyze things um, if it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and that particular product came out, we may view things a little bit differently. Um, yes, sufentanil is potent like no other. But it's all, I'm a pharmacist, and so is Charlie and our, our two student pharmacists there. The thing we always ask is, what's the dose? Bottom line. So yes, you have sufentanil in there, which is ultra potent, but what's the actual dose? When you do the dosage and the 
equilibrated MME factors, all that fun stuff, it's actually a relatively small dose. Um, so you're getting this sublingual product that's in a, how would I describe this, the shooter. Um, it looks like a dart and you push on the end and the tablet pops out under your tongue, voice messed up on purpose. So it delivers it right to where it needs to go. A little bit harder to, um, not that it's impossible, it's not abuse deterrent, but like the fact that you, it's not a pill in itself, it's this product that you shoot into your, your it's like a, looks like an oral syringe maybe, and then the, the pill pops out the bottom. Um, so it's just, it, it would be, it would take a lot more work to, to get all that together and have 10 of them or whatnot. Um, it's a new product, so I think you were somebody saying something about cost. Um, everything's always expensive. Um, but the, the Hoopla, uh, there was an FDA committee that recommended, I believe they recommended not to approve it, and then the FDA had the gall to say, we approve it. What were they thinking? Um, the, the, I was actually interviewed at some point and just said, hey, what's the deal with this? And maybe it's facts, maybe it's opinion, I don't know, but it's an ultra-potent opioid, but the dose is actually very low, and it's in a delivery device that makes it relatively safer, and it avoids, it, it could be used in different scenarios, whether they're burns or renal or this or that, it has its uses, but um, primarily ER usage, if I'm right on there. Um, and, and the point is, if this thing came out before the other products, like even if you're dosing, now picture the, the very busy ER setting, whether doctor, nurse, pharmacist, whoever, it gets hectic. I don't know from experience, but I'm told it gets pretty hectic and there could be dosing errors and this is dose proof, dose error proof, because you're, you're not IVing it, you're not whatever. Uh, you don't need an IV, but the caveat, the caveat to that is, well, if you're in there, you probably already have an IV. So avoiding an IV is kind of a no point um, most of the time. But it, the overall point is that it's not really off the wall. It's not going crazy on, oh, approving yet another opioid. When you look at the actual dose of the thing, this isn't at all the headlines read, oh, this super potent thing. And it's like, yeah, but it's actually equivalent to like a... a hydrocodone tablet or a morphine tablet, less in many cases. Um, so, does that address it? It's, it's micrograms. It ends up being the equivalent, I think, uh, don't quote me, but it's relatively something like 10 morphine, 10 milligrams morphine, something like that. Um, I, give or take a little. We're not talking, it's two digits, not three. So The trial was in like knee, knee replacement mm -hmm. patients or something. Yeah. They, um, I believe they have some follow-up ones too, but the, the they brought that thing to market in an opioid crisis, which just makes it very tough and whatnot. So, that lady that owns a drug company that developed it, she around yeah. here. Okay. And she said the Department of Defense contacted her to develop it. So I guess yes. they usually give them ketamine, and they're like out yes. there in the field, like freaking out. So it's a unique scenario where our our tax dollars. I'll paraphrase yeah. you paid for part of development in another manner. And yet now it comes out and there's the hoop, there's the defense against it or, or whatnot. Um, it's worth the conversation, but it's not gonna fly in every single department, so. Um, what do we, uh, when she's in. Uh, oh, you took care of it? <laughs> okay, sweet. Any questions on that or any of the other ones? Uh, I've got one last slide coming up here basically on just like what other things may are in the, the pipeline, if you will. But any other questions or anything? Dr. Garofoli, there was a question on the chat. It just says, I foresee EMS field use for this product if the cost is reasonable. Do you have any idea about the cost then? It's, uh, it's expensive, um, but you're talking about a, if you're talking the ER, nothing's cheap to begin with. Um, EMS probably along those same lines. I mean, it, when you see your hospital bill, everything's a lot anyway. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's all those workings for formulary and coverage within any hospital too, and they're all working on that. But um, it, it's that age old, um, if you have to do it 100 times to prevent one error on dosage, and then that could mean a lot more, obviously the human side, but the money as well too. That's for all of them to figure out. But yes, in Utopia, like the question asked, if, if cost is not a major concern, then you're looking at less errors and a, a, a dose that might not even cut it in many instances is conversations I've had. <laughs> like it, it, 
I, I know the headlines are talking about how potent it is, but it, it's not that high of a dose. It, it, I'd actually have a concern on not being enough, but for some reason it seems like it gets the job done. So. All righty, so to the pipeline. I guess we'll, we'll say adios, Buzz Light, your next slide, please. So here's, um, and there's many things. Um, there's always the quest for the, the Holy Grail. Um, some things that have just caught my eye as far as what they're working on and might even have a chance. Uh, we've got Nectar. Um, and the idea with that one, if you think back to that multi-pill abuse resistance thing I talked about, so that's talking about taking multiple pills. Um, one of the other ideas here is with this Nectar, the, the NKTR181 as they're calling it now, you'd have to, as I phrased it here, take it Tuesday to get the effect on Friday. So you're gonna get rid of potentially a lot of abuse because it would take so darn long. It's not that immediate sensation like a cigarette to the mouth or whatever. Um, that's one thing that's being worked on is just far as getting into the CNS, obviously very slowly. Another thing, um, we know the, of course, mu receptors, but now we're finding in science that there's either mu one, mu two, or subparts of mu, whatever we decide to call it. Um, and these peptides can work specifically on those particular parts. Um, this is kind of one of those, but the idea is if one part of the mu receptor contributes to respiratory depression and another part or another number or whatever we call it does not, then we might be up the right tree for getting the good effects without the negative effects. Bottom line there. Uh, beta resin is probably right along those same lines with that olaceridine. Um, Semi-interesting one is this peripheral kappa agonist. So if you think about the Super Bowl drug of the constipation ones, the Pamoras, your Movantic and, and et al., um, this would be along those same lines, but as an agonist, the kappa not mute. Something else they're working on, basically. Uh, then we have the sodium channel blockers, uh, very, very specific sodium channels. Uh, so this wouldn't be getting the effects on the heart because I know all of our minds go right to that of like, oh my goodness, what about the heart? Um, so this is just going to look to affect the surge protectors, as we call it, uh, for pain pathways. Uh, glial cell activators, been studied for decades really as far as glial cell in general. Uh, that's your security guards. Uh, they're just kind of there, but if you get them going in the immune system, when there is a problem, then they're going to be activating and, and annoying all the pain um, modulation or pathways. Um, all of these are just things that are being studied. All of them or none of them might make it actually to, to help our patients, but just some of the, the pipeline agents. Uh, the bottom line is they're all still attempts. Next slide. Um, at the quest for the what's been going on for decades of something that works for pain but is not addictive nor deadly as far as respiratory depression. Uh, if we ever get there, I don't know. I wouldn't bet on it. I'm not a betting man, so it's irrelevant. That's that. That's questions, comments, whatever else you got. Very thorough. Awesome. Thank you. Very thorough. <laughs> I mentioned something. Hey, could I mention something to the group that maybe some of you had come across in the newspaper this morning? They had, and the title is Life Saving Medicine Goes Digital. Did anybody see the Dominion Post this morning? No. Okay. So anyhow, something I did not know was actually in, in the works, but there is now a website where someone can actually get naloxone okay uh in the mail through an internet you know based uh portal and it's called naloxoneexchange.com that's one word naloxoneexchange.com and it's developed by a actually by a pharmacist in chicago and it's Developed by a company called Script Health, which I don't know much about. Maybe somebody in the audience might, and perhaps at the pain center. But anyhow, this is uh, a two-dose uh, minimum purchase, and the cost is about 140 bucks. Okay, so I tried to enter the website. Now, the website captures all the information you put into it, so, and it keeps it. So I didn't really dig deep into the website because I didn't want to put anything that was an identifier to me, you know, specifically. Um, but I was just, you know, I found it rather intriguing. 
that you can certainly it, it improves access to the drug. Uh, in West Virginia, you still need a prescription, as far as I know, for Medicaid patients and for the certain insurance companies. But this is a, a an available site for patients who live in West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Texas. So does anybody have any insight or any knowledge of or have used this site? Okay. Well, it's it's there. Okay, here's the paper. <laughs> Find the article and send it. Yeah, you can have this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that um, Charlie, good find there, and I love that you got the actual paper. Um, there, there is some hoopla around that, um, and sometimes it's like a stigmatic barrier. The, there's, uh, we have in West Virginia the Board of Pharmacy protocol for dispensing naloxone without a prescription, and that's kind of the old style. Um, now there's the standing order. It was under Dr. Gupta. It's under somebody else now. I can't think of their name, but uh, which basically makes it so that you could charge insurance for it. Those guys with that website, they've actually been in touch with our board of pharmacy. There's a, our one main person, Krista. Um, and they, they're doing good intentions, but they may be skipping a couple steps because even though the standing order is there, you're still supposed to provide some education, some random things and whatnot. But ultimately, it's trying to get it out in the community, which is a good thing. Um, Rick was actually just bringing up a good idea where I, I, my personal kick on this is more of a real estate type of thing. Uh, location, location, location. We we should do our due diligence and as healthcare professionals to get naloxone out there. But if you had deployed it like defibrillators, that may help as well. There's actually been an article or two about having it on airplanes because people needed it at some point. And should you be getting on an airplane with too many opioids in you? No, but it happens. And what are you going to do? Um, that loca I, I wouldn't say location, location, location to replace discussing it and, and providing it to patients, but in addition to, um, there's certainly the cost issues to come into play. Typically, the expiration date's about a year, which is synonymous with every prescription. And there was a study actually done by a, a group down in our state down uh, near Huntington, and the, the study actually showed that it, it really, like confidently, will last at least two years, if not more even though all the labeling is going to say a year, which begs the question of all medicines. I know, I know, but it, that's at least out there where to give somebody a, a leg to stand on. Um, one of our colleagues, CK Babcock did that one and his team. Um, so there, there's, there's a lot of hoopla out there with that. And I don't know if anybody else has any other thoughts. Naloxone's a big one, but. Um, the FDA did just approve the uh, the generic for Narcan nasal, the easy one to use, one spray, one nostril. So coming to a shelf near you. Uh, cost is always an issue. That was what the question was that brought up. Um, very long discussions on that. I think we're a minute over, but we could do a naloxone someday too. But um, you're looking at typically about, uh, as of now anyway, something in the realm of 100 to 150. For those types of products, usually 125 to keep the lights on in the pharmacy. 150. Um. All right. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody, for um, attending. But thank you, Mark, and then the uh, Caitlin and Kristen for your case. That was wonderful. So, guys, uh, we are out of time today. Our next session is on the 15th, and of course, I'll send out that reminder. Okay. Bye. Bye.